Uh, let's make a start. Has everyone or anyone had a go at that problem that I set for, for homework, the, the beam problem? Yeah, really straightforward analysis in terms of free body diagram, tube models, and so forth. You guys have calculated those critical stress elements a thousand times by now, hopefully. Um, it's just a matter of applying that last little failure criterion step um, and working out whether it's actually going to break or not, which is kind of the whole game as far as engineering is concerned. Um, it's all good and well to know how much stress is there, but uh, stress is basically meaningless unless you can relate it to the strength, um, the, the ability of something to withhold that or withstand that stress. So um, those were the first two really simplistic failure criteria that we looked at. Um, now you can sort of picture those as the very early days of engineering and people seeing things break um, and wanting to build some sort of a, an equation or a rule that means you can calculate stress and relate that to whether it's going to break or not. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of the evolution of value theories from that. Okay, so early days, very phenomenological, it broke, I think maybe this is why it breaks. Yeah? Or this is, this is some sort of empirical relationship that tells me when something might or might not break. What we're looking at today, um, and I really like this lecture actually, it's, it's much more the science of, of why things fail. Okay? And um, there's a derivation that I've put online um, that I'll talk about in a minute. That you guys can go and have a look. I used to do the whole derivation on the board. You guys don't need to know it. There's no point in doing that. Um, it's useful if you want to understand a little bit more about it, so it's there. Um, but I'll go through the first part and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, as I said, those two failure criterion from the last lecture were very phenomenological and as people started to develop, they started to think about what actually caused failure. Um, and the fourth, remember we skipped number three, the strain energy theory, I'm not bothering with that. Um, not strain energy, what was the third one? Anyway, this one's called the total strain energy theory, so that's number four. Uh, and what people started thinking was, is that maybe it's the strain energy inside the material that's actually driving this failure. And if you picture that, you've got atoms, and we've been talking about stretching those atoms to the point where they break their bonds and you get a crack, right? And so that requires energy. Energy needs to be imparted to those atoms to separate them far enough to beat those bonds and cause failure. So it makes sense to us that it would be the energy that is kept in that item causing that strain to be the driver of failure. Um, and so the first thing, and the first time that they were actually trying to get a little bit more scientific about failure, was this strain or total strain energy. So the total strain energy within an item, and you relate that to whether it will or won't fail. Now, I'm not sure whether you've seen this, hopefully you have, but um, if not, this is just our standard stress strain curve, so stress strain curve up to yield and off to failure and so forth. And the area under that curve is actually what we call the strain energy. Okay? So if you were to take the area under that curve, that's the amount of strain energy that some sort of component has. And you can imagine, effectively, you do work on something to stretch it, yeah? And that work is equal to the amount of potential energy that is kept in that item in its stretch configuration, right? So that's the energy we're talking about. The energy that basically, if I let go of that, that energy turns from potential energy to kinetic energy to return it to its original shape, right? So you always impart energy on something when you do work, or you have energy in something when you impart work on it, right? That's what this is. And you can calculate it very simply in the area under that curve. So in two dimensions, U is just very simply stress times strain divided by two, so the area of the triangle, yeah? Um, in three dimensions, if we have our three principal stresses, C1, 2, and 3, and the associated principal strains, so epsilon 1, 2, and 3, then the same deal, same similar type of equation, just the multiples of each of those groups, and the whole thing divided by two. All right, so let's, we're working in three dimensions now because there's no point not. Um, everything we do is in three dimensions, even if one of the dimensions has zero values. So we've got an equation now for the strain energy. Um, 
we don't want to have strains in there, principal strains. We don't want epsilons in that equation because if you did, not only would you have to do all of these shear force bending moment, etc. diagrams and calculate the stress element, you'd have to do a similar thing by calculating the deflections and then relating that to strain and using Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio and all that kind of stuff. So you have to calculate two values. You don't want to do that, right? So what we're going to do is get rid of those strains. Have you guys seen this equation for principal strains and their relationship to the principal stresses? So you guys are across the idea of Poisson's ratio and Young's modulus and the relationship between stress and strain. Stress equals Young's modulus times strain. That's one dimension. All right. As soon as you get to two and three dimensions, so one dimensional, very easy. But once you, if you think of your tensile test or a plate or something like that, and you stretch it this way, it's going to contract this way. Yeah. And that's what Poisson's ratio deals with. Um, if it contracts, if the volume stays exactly perfect, so you have 100% um, preservation of volume, then Poisson's ratio is 0.5. And if you start to, I guess, lose volume, then, or gain volume, probably gain volume, um, then Poisson's ratio is less than 0.5. Alright? But either way, the relationship between the three principal strains and the three principal stresses, you know, in one dimension is just strain equals one on E stress. But in three dimensions, you need that Poisson's ratio in there. And that Poisson's ratio deals with all three dimensions of stress as well. All right? So these are just the typical principal strain equations and how they relate to the principal stresses based on that. Now what we can do is take these three things and throw them here so that we can get rid of those strains. All right? So we sum them straight into that equation. And what we get is this bad boy. Right? So now we have a whole big long-winded equation for the total strain energy that's based purely on principal stress and uh, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. So if I gave you uh, an applied stress element, or if you did a sharp or a beam calculation or something, and you got a principal stress or an applied stress element, you could go and calculate SIG 1, 2, and 3, and you'd know how much total strain energy there was in that exact place of the material. Yeah? Easy enough. Right, that still doesn't tell us anything about failure. It's just an extra pretty number that we can calculate. What we need to do is work out at what strain energy, what value of U, this thing's going to break. What value of U is going to be enough to start separating those atoms and actually break the thing. Right? And if we're talking about strain energy, and we're saying this one value, U, is responsible for failure, then the value of U should be the same irrespective of what the load case is, right? So if you've got a tensile test and you've got, you know, sigma 1 equals something and sigma 2 or 3 equals 0, whatever value of U you get to at, let's say, yield point, because we're talking about static value, whatever value of U is at yield point should be the same value of U as if I've got a biaxial test. And now I'm stretching in a different way and at some point that's going to yield. And this value of U at yield at that point should be the same if this is if this is a useful failure criterion. And again, if I have triaxial loading, so all three dimensions, should be the same value of U. So if we can calculate a single representative value of U, then that equation that we had before becomes useful to us, right? So let's say U is 10,000 joules. And if we know that, and then we can work out these values on the right, we can work out whether we're more or less than that. We're great. We can, we can tell whether something's failed or not. So what we're trying to do is get that value for you. And if you is the same for everything, obviously not, we're not going to do some crazy complicated triaxial test. We're going to do the one that we really like, the dog bone test that we can do in our instrument lab down here. Uh, and we're going to calculate U from that. And then that's the U we're going to use for our value criteria, right? So let's do a uniaxial test. Remembering that sigma 1, we carry it up to the yield point and we know that yield occurs at SY, so when that curve starts you know, bending off and going into the plastic region, we can identify that on that uniaxial test. So at that point, sigma 1 is SY, sigma 2 and 3 is 0. 
Go back to my previous equation. If I have sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, can I get an expression for u? Yes, I can. So, we sub that into that. And we you know, cancel out all of the zeros. These make lots of nice things go away. And what we're left with is this equation here. And so if I know S y for a material, I know what total strain energy will cause failure or will be responsible at that failure point. All right? So let's say S y is you know, 200 megapascals, and I know Young's modulus, I can calculate an exact value for u. Everyone good with that? Now remember what I said, if I have an exact value for u that I can put on the left hand side of that equation, I can work out whether we're failing or not. So that's exactly what we do. It's just that rather than use an exact value, I like to keep my s, y and my e in this equation because obviously an exact value is only useful for one type of material, whereas e and s, y is applicable to all types of material. So let's carry that. Let's throw it over to the left hand side of the same equation. And now, if I rearrange that a little bit, I get this. And this is effectively the equation to that yield surface, or the failure surface, like what we were talking about yesterday. And if I rearrange that a little bit, just by bringing S wide over here and saying, you know, 1 on the left equals this at the failure surface, or N on the left is my factor of safety, then I get this equation here. Now this equation is exactly equivalent to what we had yesterday, which is n equals sy divided by sigma 1, or n equals sys divided by tau max. It's just that this part is a little bit more complicated because materials are more complicated than just saying it's just the normal stress or it's just the shear stress. In this case, it's the energy, which is a combination of normal and shear stress and all of the good things that are going on at the atomic level. Okay? So that's what this equation is, and we can actually work out value now based on it. So if we had a stress element and we knew what SY was for the material, I could calculate a factor of safety, which is great. Right? And this is what our failure surface looks like in 2D. Remember our, uh, what was it, maximum normal stress was a square, and our maximum shear stress was kind of that kind of shape. So this is more of an overly circular, it's a kind of a shitty shape, but um, it's, it's a, a, a circular S shape that is our yield surface. We need to work out whether we're inside or outside, and we simply just apply that equation. Right, so let's have a go at that, because we're going to move on in a second. Um, so you might as well use it, think about it, and we'll move on. Alright, so let's say SY equals 250 megapascals. So something in uh, maybe just a bit better than mild steel.
the same as our A's and B's here? Oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, sure. Um, A equals 207 for a steel generally, GPA. There's actually a table in your textbook um, that will have all these values. And let's just assume Poisson's ratio, what's a steel value? About 0.45 normally? 0.45. Almost incompressible. Oh, you don't need any of that, right? You better not. Of course, I'm trying to see it here. These are just indicative uh, or approximate. Feel free to go online and find some better values for course of ratio this afternoon and later. Please don't commit these to memory as the values you use for steel forever.
Right? And you remember that the key assumption of total strain energy is that we have the same amount of energy for each one of these, the same amount of total energy. And so something else is going on. And so it was a good crack. We tried hard, but it's garbage. We need something better. Um, and the reason that it doesn't work is because we're talking about total strain energy. And there's actually different modes of energy that we can break things up into. So we can actually break um, stress, strain, energy, any number of other quantities up into two different types of components. The first one is volumetric or hydrostatic. So that's your triaxial even in every direction. The second one is deviatoric and that's your shear, the stepping over it. If I go on the next slide, I've got examples of each. So this is your volumetric. For volumetric, you have exactly the same force in every direction, exactly the same stress in every direction, right? So that's volumetric. It changes the volume. It either makes the volume smaller or it makes the volume larger. Okay? Um, and if we have sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3, our Mohr circle is a decimal point. It is an infinitesimally small little dot. We don't have any shear at all. It is purely hydrostatic stress. Okay, so that's what a Mohr circle for a hydrostatic case looks like. Um, tau equals zero. Deviatoric means pure shear, no normal stress at all on this element. So I should have my other two shear vectors there, but I'm illustrating it as a box that sits over. It's got pure shear and no normal stress. And the only way that we draw that on a Mohr circle is a centralised circle. So at the point of maximum shear, we have zero normal stress. All right, so if we drew our maximum shear stress element, we'd have positive value, negative value, and zero on every face for the normal stress. Okay? And so this is what deviatoric stress, strain, energy refers to. That's what volumetric all those quantities refer to. And if we were to break our energy up into those terms and our stresses and strains up into those terms, remembering that the rock example withstand almost infinite amounts of volumetric force, okay? Because, you know, rocks go as deep as we have any understanding until things start getting molten, and so at that point, that volumetric force has caused the atoms to get so hot that they, you know, become molten. But otherwise, rocks can basically withstand infinite amounts of that. So obviously, that mode, this volumetric mode, isn't causing failure. By example, rocks don't fail, ergo, that doesn't cause failure. We can do the same thing in the lab. So, if you can break it up into that and that doesn't cause failure, then it's telling us that perhaps this is the component that is causing failure. And if we can break it up into the volumetric and the deviatoric component and isolate the deviatoric parts, then maybe we get a better approximation to our failure. So, that's exactly what we do. Same deal, same process, same formulation, except now, we're saying U has both volumetric and deviatoric components and uh, anyone that's done anything to do with tensile mechanics or anything would know that you just add those. Same thing with the stresses, you can just add volumetric and deviatoric components. Uh, if you don't know that, feel free to Wikipedia. Alright, so U we know, obviously from, from before we can calculate U from our tensile test or whatever. Yeah? Um, and we have an equation for it or whatever. Uh, UD is what we're saying relates to failure. All right, so we need to work out, isolate that deviatoric U because then we can actually get a decent failure criteria. Now, our principal stresses, once again, our principal stress can break up into volumetric and deviatoric components. And you notice that I have one deviatoric, two deviatoric, three deviatoric, which is a V and V. That's because if you have a volumetric stress, it has to be the same in all three directions. So this value will always be the same, whereas these values are different. Um, and we can actually do a bit of manipulation. Uh, now, there's three pages of derivation between this step and this step. And that's the PDF that's online. I could write it on the board for you. I don't think you guys need it. It's not a core skill that you required for this course. It's interesting, so I suggest you have a bit of a read through it if you like derivations and understanding where things come from. It's useful. But basically, in that derivation, you put these three things into the equation that we have for you. You play around with it. The fact that the three 
deviatory, uh, sorry, three volumetric components are the same, gives us some advantages to try and remove them from the equation entirely. And what you end up with is UD equals these things. And you notice these values are the principal stresses, because we don't want to calculate principal stresses and then have to break them up into volumetric and deviatory components every time we play with them. What we want is an equation that relates the principal stresses to the deviatory component. And so that's what that derivation is. So it's very easy just to sub that in and say, all right, let's go and calculate those stresses. But um, it, it's much more complicated as a practical tool to do that. So we've rearranged them such that we have the whole total principal stresses giving us the deviatory component of strain, uh, or strain energy. Once again, we do exactly what we did before. We do a uniaxial test. And this time, those uniaxial sig 1, 2s and 3s we sub into this guy because that gives us the deviatory component of strain at that failure point. Once again, it looks like this. 1 plus Poisson's ratio is slightly different to the previous one because we have a slightly different equation, obviously. Put that on the left-hand side of this guy and rearrange and get SY equals an equation that looks pretty similar to what we had before. But remember what we had before. Let's have a look at it. Uh, it has minus two Poisson ratio in front of this. So basically a two Poisson ratio in front of each of these terms. And now effectively that's all the weight. That's the major difference. Okay. So it's, it's only slightly different. But it's that Poisson ratio thing now, you know, different things between volumetric change and shear change and things like that, the Poisson ratio is actually accounting for. So it makes sense to us that it's not there. Once again, we just rearrange and we get a factor of safety. Factor of safety equals SY on sigma dash. And this is the equation for sigma dash. And that really good von Mises stress that I've been talking about, um, being a nice representative stress that I'll be talking about, I'm now talking about. All right. This is von Mises stress. This is our stress that we, we have a bunch of principal stresses or even applied stresses. We can calculate one stress that represents the way those stresses will fail the material. This is the representative failure stress and represents the whole stress state. All right? Shear stresses, normal stresses, it, it represents the deviatory component of those stresses that are going to cause failure. So it's the best stress to represent failure to us. It's the stress that we use in every single finite element analysis because it's what we can relate straight back to a yield stress very quickly like this. Um, particularly for ductile metals like steel. So generally speaking, this is for steels. Um, von Mises becomes less uh, useful when von Mises failure criterion or the distortion energy theory is not applicable. So for brittle materials and cast lines and things like that, von Mises is not really as applicable because it's not the theory that applies to them. But for steels, this is our stress. This is what we calculate every day of work. Right. And that's what the yield surface looks like. The other one was circular, this one's circular, except this is actually a perfect ellipse. So uh, it's really nice and mathematical and all that kind of thing. Um, and I've also shown on here this dotted line. So it's called Tresca, because the guy Tresca was the one that came up with the maximum shear stress theory. But that's just our maximum shear stress theory, our straight lines. And look how the maximum shear stress theory and the von Mises theory relate to one another. Very, very close. So Tresca, Tresca got pretty close, yeah? Pretty close with a very rudimentary theory. Uh, von Mises is based on the actual science of energy and what's going on in the atoms. And we know from experiments and from plenty of proofs since this theory was devised that the von Mises won spot on. Absolutely spot on. So you do an experiment with steel and those failure points will dot this curve almost perfectly, plus or minus the area that you get in each experiment. Alright, so von Mises is exactly what's happening in the material. Look at the maximum shear stress. Is that more or less uh, conservative? More conservative. More conservative. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're saying using this theory, and you've got a dot between the two lines. As far as maximum shear is concerned, it's failing, but as far as von Weiss is concerned, it's not. So it's more conservative to use the maximum shear. 
it's really quick. And it's only more conservative by a very small margin. So it, it, it's not a bad choice if you need to do something quick and dirty to use that. It will get you very close. Okay? It's not the exact, but it's very close. So it's an appropriate theorem. And so both of these theorems are appropriate for ductile materials like spheres. Okay? Um, it's a very good theory. Um, and this, I'll talk about 3D possibly in the lecture's time or two. But in the 3D space, this is actually a cylinder that goes up along the C1, C2, C3, all the equal axis. So along that volumetric, so if I was to draw that 3D axis right, I've got a 3D picture of this in one of the future slides, so don't stress out too much if this makes no sense to you. But if I had, let's say, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Remember what we said? Volumetric stress, if sigma 1, 2, and 3 are all equal, then you're never going to get fired. And so there is a line on that curve where sigma 1, 2, and 3 are equal that goes off infinitely. And it's basically sort of at 45, if it was a 2D, it would be up at 45 degrees, but in 3D, it's sort of up, you know, out of place like that. So up like this, that way, and back down that way into the compression range. And if you never get a fail along that plane, or along that line, and you're probably not going to fail if you deviate too much from it, because you're pretty close, most of your stress is um, volumetric, then what we actually end up with is a cylinder that goes up like that. And it just so happens that if you cut a cylinder at a 45 degree angle, you get the lips. That's exactly what this is. This is just a 2D section cut straight through a cylinder that's going up at that angle. Okay? So this is what we use in 2D, but this is just a 2D plane of a cylinder that goes up forever. And it goes up forever because of rocks and because of you know, materials that can take that uh, triaxial compression forever. All right? And so that's the way materials fail. And the reason I really like this lecture is because it's an actual understanding of what's going on in the material. So if we think about those atoms, if you have that volumetric, you can stretch them all the way out and all the way in, and that's not what's causing those atoms to actually fail. All right? What's causing them to fail is when you start to get shear in between them. All right? And that's the mechanism that's causing failure, and it's the energy that it takes to get that shearing on those atoms that starts to cause them to break their bonds. Um, and that's where failure comes from. And this expression is a really elegant account, a nice mathematical, rigorous, based on science account of that failure that we can use every single day in our engineering, which is really nice. I like that. So that's why I really like my mice. Okay. Um, all right. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, you've got the sig 1, 2, and 3 from the previous example. Calculate my mice stress for me using them. Um, and calculate an N from the distortion energy theory. Um, and compare that to your previous one. So that should take two minutes. Okay, is everyone got a number? Yeah. So uh, hopefully everyone's calculated by my C C the dash. What value did you get? A four point six. Yeah, megapascal. I think I got six two megapascal, depending on how many years you carry through. All right, and that gives us an N of what? 2.95 um, and therefore obviously not violent. And that's not that much different to the previous one. Okay? It's not that much different because it makes sense to us that if something's that that element that we're looking at, that's mostly deviatoric anyway. There's not a lot of volumetric going on there. Firstly, that is compression and that's tension, so that's causing more deviatoric. And then you've got shear on it, so that's causing deviatoric. And in that range, the total energy theory is pretty close. It's just when we start getting very large volumetric forces like the wood going down the ground or high pressure or whatever, that that starts going complete, you know, basically to complete health. Um, so we would expect that we're pretty close between the two theories for this circumstance. Um, it's just that obviously one mice is as accurate for everything, the other one's only just accurate because it's accidentally accurate in this circumstance. Okay? Um, now, this is all in, I think we're up to about chapter six of your textbook. 
So if you want to read a bit more on it, there's that there. Um, in that chapter, there's about four or five different equations for von Lysis. You can actually get an equation for von Lysis that's based on applied stresses, so sigma x, sigma y, tau x, y, and so forth. So it saves you the more circle step, um, which is very beneficial, um, particularly if you're in a hurry in a quiz and I haven't explicitly told you to do a more circle. Um, so maybe write down a few of those different equations and use them. You will have seen already that most of these cancel out. So for the 2D stress state where one of these is zero, that one goes away, that one goes away, and that one goes away, and you're left with sig1 squared plus sig2 squared minus sig1 sig2. And that's a pretty easy equation as well. So there's lots of different formulations of the von Weiss's equation. I'm happy for you to use any of them, so long as you get it right as per normal. Yeah, we're, we're engineers now. We can choose choose our own adventure. Um, we'll just, yeah, do it right. Good. All right. Thanks, guys.